We come again to thank you for this day, to thank you that you are the Lord of our moments, the Lord of our life. We thank you that you have ordained this day for your purposes to be fulfilled. We commit to you our hearts for that purpose, Lord, individually and also in this church. We pray that you would pour out your spirit upon us and that you would teach us and that you would help us to honor and glorify and exalt you in all that we are and do. We commit this time to you. We pray, Father, for the anointing of your Holy Spirit and for the illumination of your Holy Spirit, that all that is said would be truth and that all that is said would be truly honoring and glorifying to thee, to the Lord Jesus Christ, and to your gospel. We commit this time into your hands. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to look today at the uh, final subject on the papacy, which will also be our final session under the broad topic of authority. And we have looked uh, thus far at the Roman teaching of papal primacy, and today we want to examine the teaching of Vatican I on papal infallibility. Now, as with the uh, teaching on Vatican I on primacy, what I want to do is just summarize the teaching for you. Here's some handouts if you all want to uh, go ahead and take these. The handouts uh, are the specific decrees of Vatican I on papal infallibility. So I won't read through that whole decree. What I want to do is just summarize the teachings for you. You can read that yourself from the sheet that I've handed out to you. Vatican I's teachings can be summarized in the following points. Number one, the supreme power of teaching is included in the apostolic primacy. Secondly, when speaking ex cathedra, that is when speaking officially as the Roman pontiff, authoritatively, In defining a doctrine on a matter of faith or morals, the Roman pontiff teaches infallibly. Number three, these definitions are irreformable of themselves and not from the consent of the church. The judgment of the Roman pontiff is final and can be judged by no man. Fourthly, the dogma of papal infallibility has been held, uh, has been held by and can be validated uh, by the perpetual practice of the church, the ecumenical councils, and the unanimous consent of the fathers, according to Vatican I. Fifthly, if any question of faith arises within the church universal, it must be defined by the judgment of the Roman pontiff. Sixthly, the Roman church has always remained free from all blemish of error, and the doctrines of the Catholic faith have always been kept undefiled by her. And then finally, if anyone refuses to believe or contradicts those teachings, he is under anathema. That is, he's condemned to hell for all eternity. Now, infallibility means that the Pope is guaranteed immunity from error when exercising his teaching authority on matters of faith and morals. Uh, This immunity from error only applies when the Pope is speaking as an authoritative teacher. That is, when what the Roman Catholic Church calls uh, ex cathedra statements are being made. Infallibility, according to the Roman Church, does not mean that the Pope is sinless. Okay, It means that he cannot err when authoritatively teaching on faith and morals. It doesn't mean that he is sinless or that he will be pre- preserved uh, free from all sin. Some people mistaken that. It, uh, it, it does not have to do with what the Roman Catholic Church would call indefectibility. It has to do with infallibility, which simply has to do with teaching on faith and morals. The Roman Catholic Church's main scriptural reference for support for its claim for infallibility comes from three major passages of scripture. First of all, there are the familiar words of Jesus Christ to Peter. I say unto you, you are Peter, on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I will give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. The Roman Catholic Church teaches that the gift of infallibility is implied in Christ's promise to Peter where he says that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That is, against his church and the church being founded there, uh, therefore upon the rock, which is Peter and the bishops of Rome. Therefore, implied in that is that the gates of hell will not prevail against the bishops of Rome. They will be preserved from error. Now, in addition to Matthew 16, the Church of Rome also points to Luke 22:32, where, where uh, the Lord Jesus again says to Peter, I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And then another verse or a passage of Scripture it points to is John 21, verses 15 to 17, where Jesus asks Peter, this is after the resurrection, 
He asks him, Peter, do you love me? Asking that three times, he says, feed my sheep. Three times, feed my sheep. Did you love me? Feed my sheep. Very embarrassing situation for Peter, a very convicting time for him, but a restoring time at the same time. And, and the Lord Jesus uh, commissions him. Basically, he says, feed my sheep. Now, in addition to these foundational passages, uh, the Church of Rome also claims that the promises of Christ to be with, with his church by his spirit being in the church, likewise, would presuppose infallibility. Now, the key word in all of this, obviously, is the word implied. Uh, the, the, the church, the, the Roman Catholic Church, has to use that word because the, the teaching of infallibility is not explicit in any of those passages of Scripture. It comes down, then, to an issue of interpretation. And the crucial question is, therefore, whether or not the presuppositions that they read into, if you will, those, those passages are true, or whether it is possible to come up with a different interpretation that is actually a better interpretation, which is more accurate. Now, as with the issue of papal uh, primacy, so also with the subject of papal infallibility, we want to subject this teaching to the two tests that Vatican I says can be applied to its teachings on the papacy. That first test is the test of patristic interpretation, or what they call the unanimous consent of the fathers, relative to the passages of Scripture that they use as a foundation for their teaching. And then secondly, there's the test of history, or what they call the universal practice of the church. Well, let's look at the test of patristic interpretation. We've looked in detail at the historical exegesis of Matthew 16 in our subject of papal primacy, we saw that relative to the issue of the meaning of the rock and the keys, that the fathers unanimously reject the Roman Catholic interpretation. The same is true regarding the interpretation of Matthew 16 with respect to papal infallibility. None of the fathers have interpreted the phrase, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church, as meaning a personal infallibility which had been conveyed to Peter and through him to the bishops of Rome as his successors. Such an interpretation is literally non-existent in the patristic literature. There's not one father who has taught that in the history of the entire church. Not one who has interpreted Matthew 16 in that way. And when you investigate the interpretation of Luke 22 and John 21, you find exactly the same thing. There's not the slightest hint in the fathers who interpret these passages of a belief in papal infallibility or that these passages even remotely suggests that. Uh, Augustine and Jerome, for example, are representative of the historic interpretation of the church as a whole when they, in, they interpret Luke 22 in two ways. First of all, it applies to Peter personally. There's a personal application of that to Peter, and they interpret it to him personally. Secondly, it applies to the church as a whole because they view Peter as being a figure or a representative of the church as a whole. It's the church universal. You find the whole church embodied in Peter. He's a figure, if you will, for every believer. Uh, one interpretation is Ambrosiaster. Uh, it, this is what Ambrosiaster says. Clearly in Peter all are contained. Praying for Peter, Jesus is understood to have prayed for all. It is always the people who are rebuked or praised in a leader. This is why he also says elsewhere, I pray for those whom you have given me. So the patristic exegesis of this passage sees Christ's prayer for Peter as a guarantee that Peter's faith will not ultimately fail, not that he would be infallible. Being representative of the church, the prayer means then that Christ will not allow the church ultimately to completely fall away. Carl Fried Froelich, who is a theologian at uh, Princeton, I think he's still at Princeton, He's done probably more research on the patristic and medieval interpretation of Matthew 16 and Luke 22 than any other man in this century. He makes this statement. In the general stream of normative exegesis, the Peter who was upheld by Christ's prayer and whose faith was tempted and yet did not finally succumb clearly remained a figure of the church. For most exegetes, this meant in the first instance a type of the universal church and of every individual believer. Now, the situation is similar when you turn to John 21, where Jesus questions Peter about his love, and he commands him to feed his sheep. For Augustine, as with, a Luke, as with his interpretation of Luke 22, this same verse or this same passage has two meanings. 
He interprets it, first of all, to apply to Peter personally, but in applying it to him personally, he interprets it as meaning a, uh, a test of discipleship or as giving us a the meaning of personal discipleship. This verse had nothing to do, from Augustine's standpoint, with papal primacy and an exclusive teaching authority over the entire church, which implied a gift of infallibility. This per- verse had to do with the meaning of true discipleship. If you're going to love Christ, you're going to do his will. And Christ commissioned Peter to feed his sheep. So it was an issue of love for Augustine and the way he interpreted that. Prove your love to me, Peter, by committing yourself to feed my sheep and to give yourself for my sheep. Then secondly, as with Luke 22, Peter is seen as a figure, a representative, if you will, of all pastors. And he's been charged with authority to shepherd the flock of Christ and to teach them. He's a figure of all pastors who have been charged with authority by Christ to feed the flock of God. So he is representative then, on the one hand, uh, in Luke 22 of the church universal. In John 21, he's figurative uh, representative, if you will, of the uh, pastors of the leadership of the, leadership of the church who have authority to teach in the church. Now, Augustine's view was representative of the patristic age. It became normative for the theologians who followed into the medieval ages, uh, which brings us to a consideration of the interpretation of these scriptures in the church after the patristic age. The patristic age ends in the 8th century with John of Damascus. In the Middle Ages, Luke 22 and John 21 were never applied exclusively to Peter and through him to the bishops of Rome. The theologians and exegetes of the 8th through the 14th centuries, which is just a general uh, time frame that we consider to be the Middle Ages, it, you could extend that up probably to the 15th century. 8th to the 15th century generally is the Middle Ages. From the 8th to the 14th centuries, theologians and exegetes universally follow Augustine's interpretation and applied the verses to Peter personally and then to Peter as representative of the church as a whole. All of the theologians, doctors, and canonists of the church followed the patristic interpretation. They did not view Luke 22 as granting any kind of a personal infallibility to Peter, much less to the bishops of Rome. According to them, Christ did not promise to Peter personal immunity from error in his leadership but the grace of final perseverance. That's how they interpreted the verses. That's universal throughout the church. What did this mean when Christ said this to Peter, that he would pray that his faith would not fail him? He prayed that his faith would not ultimately fail, that he would have grace to persevere, even though he may stumble and fall for a time. But he promises that he will preserve Peter from final failure. He will bring him back. And Christ's promise to Peter, representative of the church, uh, that was interpreted simply to mean that the church would always survive, that the true faith would always live on, even if it meant that it was in a tiny remnant. So they're talking here about the perseverance of the saints, if you will. There's a guarantee of perseverance in some degree, not infallibility. It has absolutely nothing to do with infallibility. Now, that was the common doctrine of the church. It was the view of the universally recognized and authoritative Glossa Ordinaria of Johannes Teutonicus, uh, that was the authority in the church for many, many, many years. It was the authoritative, uh, I guess, interpretation, if you will, or commentary in the church that was used as, as a foundation for all other commentaries. So this is expressive, then, of what the view generally of the church was in those centuries. The whole view of the church in interpreting Luke 22, whether it was to Peter personally or to the church as representative Peter, was one of indefectibility as opposed to infallibility when it came to interpreting Luke 22 uh, and John 21 in particular. Now, the medieval theologians and canonists never taught that the popes were infallible. In fact, just the opposite. It was universally believed that popes could err. It was not until the 14th century that one begins to see a reinterpretation of those primary texts of Matthew 16, Luke 22, and John 21, a reinterpretation to reflect a theory of papal infallibility that was beginning to develop in the 14th century. Brian Tierney, who has done extensive research on the origins of teaching, of the, of the teaching of papal infallibility, makes this statement regarding the views of the 12th and 13th century canonists who were the authoritative commentators of their day. 
He says, what can be proved beyond doubt is that no public teaching affirming the infallibility of the Pope was transmitted to the canonists of the 12th and 13th centuries in whose works for the first time abundant text for the investigation of this whole question becomes available. The commentators on Gratian's decretum knew all the most important texts forged in genuine relating to the authority of the Pope and the indefectibility of the Roman Church. They did not associate those texts with any doctrine of papal infallibility. They showed no awareness that any of their predecessors had ever associated them with such a doctrine. The theologians of the 13th century could not possibly have taken the doctrine of papal infallibility from the canonical tradition of the church because the doctrine simply did not exist in the writings of the canonists. What he's saying is that there was a point in time much later in the history of the church when this theory began to evolve. There's a very definite starting point that he pinpoints for us in the, in the 14th century when the doctrine or the teaching of papal infallibility began to emerge. But basically what he says is for the entire 14 centuries of the church, the first 14 centuries, there is no teaching of papal infallibility. And the major fathers, doctors, or theologians of the church. Vatican I also mentions what is called the formula of formistus. That is, it's the statement that the Roman church or the apostolic see has always kept the faith undefiled. And they use this as a proof, as, as a statement then of papal infallibility. Hormistus was a pope in the 6th century. He makes the statement that, that in the apostolic see, the faith of the church, the Catholic faith, has always been kept undefiled. Well, Roman uh, Vatican I takes that to mean that this pope and thereby all the church uh, as a whole recognized papal infallibility. But the church for centuries did not interpret the statement, that statement as meaning personal infallibility in the bishop of Rome. The way they interpreted it was that the church of Rome as a whole had always maintained true faith even though individual popes had erred. That's how they interpreted it. They never viewed the popes as being infallible. Now that's clear from the fact that the same ecumenical council of 680 AD, the sixth ecumenical council, which approved the statement of Hormistus, also condemned a pope as a heretic. Now they're accepting the statement on the one hand that the faith has always been kept undefiled in the apostolic see, and yet on the, on the same hand they will turn around and they will condemn authoritatively condemn a pope as a heretic. So clearly they did not view that statement as meaning that the popes themselves as individuals were infallible or that they had been preserved from uh, ever falling into error by Christ. So we see that as with the interpretation of Matthew 16, we find the Roman Catholic Church interpreting Scripture completely contrary to the unanimous consent of the fathers and the overall church throughout the centuries. Now, Vatican I teaches that this was a view of the church in the very beginning. If so, you would find that view expressed in the patristic interpretation of Matthew 16, Luke 22, and John 21, yet you do not find the view of Vatican I expressed by any of the fathers, by any of the theologians by any of the doctors of the church or the canonists of the church for the first 14 centuries. Prior to the 14th century, there is not one word from any of these authoritative teachers which would validate or support the view of Vatican I. So relative to the first test that Vatican I offers us, the test of the unanimous consent of the fathers or the patristic interpretation of those passages which are foundational for their teaching of papal infallibility, the church fails. It fails the very test that it offers to us. Let's look at the second test, the test of history. Brian Tierney makes the important observation that there is an historical dimension to the problem of infallibility. It's not just an issue of theology. Uh, he puts it in these terms. Vatican Council I did not simply decree that the Pope was infallible. It declared that the dogma of infallibility belonged to the ancient and constant faith of the church and that in promulgating it, the council was adhering to the tradition received from the beginning of the Christian faith. So one of the best tests, therefore, for determining the validity of Roman Catholic teaching with respect to the popes, uh, either be a, a papal primacy or a papal infallibility, are the facts of history. If the claims for papal infallibility, which are based on a, the interpretation of a select group of scriptural references, is true, then we would also find that teaching confirmed – 
in church history. It's going to work itself out in a practical sense because when you talk about infallibility, you're talking about something that's going to go on through the ages and you're going to see it evidenced in the lives of the popes. So as Charity points out, can one embraces that argument when it asserts that this teaching has been the perpetual practice and belief of the church from the very beginning and that it can be supported by the universal consent of the fathers. Okay, so it's, it's basically making an appeal to history to validate its claim. Now, Roman Catholic writers have admitted that some popes have contradicted other popes in their private opinions or in their disciplinary rulings, but they still argue, as uh, if you take it in the words of Carl Keating, for example, never has any pope officially contradicted what an earlier pope officially taught about faith and morals. And he says the same thing can be said of ecumenical councils, which also teach infallibly. Now, that's an impressive claim. Unfortunately, it isn't true. <laughs> the teaching of papal infallibility can be held only by ignoring or renouncing or distorting historical facts. All right, let's look at a number of incidents which highlight what I've just said. First incident I'd like to look at is Pope Liberius. Liberius was pope from 352 to 366. He reigned during the Arian Controversy which taught that Christ was a created being, that Jesus was not God. The Council of Nicaea in 325 officially condemned this teaching and affirmed the truth of the deity of Jesus. Now, Liberius initially was a defender of the Nicene faith, and he was an opponent of Arius' teaching, as a result of which he was deposed and banished by the emperor. In his place, the Roman clergy elected an Arian by the name of Felix II. Now, eventually... Uh, uh, Liberius was banished, all right? He was sent away in banishment. Eventually, he acquiesced to Arian demands by signing an Arianizing confession and agreeing to the excommunication of Athanasius, who obviously was the, the, the real champion of the Nicene Orthodoxy. Liberius acknowledged his condemnation of uh, Athanasius in a personal letter. Actually, he wrote, I believe, three personal letters. But in one of those letters, this is what he says. I hereby inform your wisdom that I condemned Athanasius, who was bishop of the Alexandrian church, and he was cut off from the communion of the Roman church, as all the priesthood of the Roman church is witness. And when you condemn Athanasius, you clearly state that you condemn what Athanasius teaches, which is the orthodox doctrine of the Trinity. Now, by signing that heretical confession and condemning Athanasius, Liberius was allowed to return to Rome and to resume his position as Bishop of Rome. We believe that he probably later reversed his position again and probably came back to an orthodox position relative to his belief in the Trinity. But it cannot be denied that Liberius temporarily, at least, endorsed a semi-Arian confession and did so as a legitimate pope. Now, that's verified by Athanasius himself, by Hilary of Poitiers, and by Jerome. They all verify that for us. Liberius obviously apostatized for personal and political reasons. But if the Roman Catholic Church's interpretation of Matthew 16 is really true, if it is correct, and the Holy Spirit will guarantee that no heresy will infect the papacy, then that incident would never have occurred. He would have prevented, even under the circumstances of coercion, which, and it's true, Liberius was coerced. He was under uh, tremendous pressure. But even so, the Spirit of God, if this is true, and what Christ said he would do, he would not allow the gates of hell to prevail against the church as embodied in the bishops of Rome, then that's a supernatural gift and that's a supernatural power that will come to play and he will prevent that from happening. That did not happen. Liberius apostatized temporarily. And it's, it's certainly true that there are many other people who have withstood a lot worse persecution than banishment, and who have stood faithful to the faith by the power of the Holy Spirit without apostatizing from the faith. So we, we can talk all day long about coercion, but it really is meaningless because this is basically on the shoulders of the Spirit of God, if you will, and to, to use a figurative expression, to bring this to pass. It's a supernatural power which, according to the Roman Catholic interpretation, which will cause this to happen. Well, it obviously failed. Liberius apostatized. That's our first example. The next example is that of Pope Zosimus, who reigned from 417 to 418. He was embroiled in the Pelagian controversy, 
he wrote an encyclical letter. And in writing an encyclical, an encyclical letter, he is writing authoritatively on a matter related to faith and morals with a, uh, directly with, with an issue directly related to the whole issue of uh, Pelagius. He writes this encyclical letter basically rebuking Augustine and the whole North African church for their condemnation of Pelagius and his teachings. He declared that Pelagius and his main disciple Celestius were orthodox in their teaching, and he demanded that the North African church change its views and submit to his judgment and authority. Now, what is particularly significant is that this was done in direct opposition to his predecessor, the Bishop of Rome, Innocent I, who had also authoritatively condemned Pelagius. He reversed his decision, his decree. Now, the African bishops warned Zosimus that he was being misled by Pelagius and Celestius, and they appealed to him to uphold the official judgment of Pope Innocent. Well, he wrote back to them that he had already given the whole affair his thorough consideration. He refused to, uh, to listen to them. Well, the North African church then assembled a general synod of their own in which 200 bishops were present, and they passed a number of canons specifically condemning the teachings of Pelagius. Now, that was done in defiance of the express decrees of Zosimus, thus giving clear evidence that the early church did not believe that the bishops of Rome were infallible. As a result of their opposition, Pope Zosimus reversed his position, and he finally condemned the Pelagian heresy. Now, this is not a case of a pope expressing a private opinion and then becoming better informed and changing his mind. The pope not only reversed the judgment of a previous bishop of Rome, he also officially contradicted himself. He retracted what he had previously authoritatively announced in an encyclical letter on an issue of major doctrinal importance. So here you have the case of an infallible pope being rebuked for error and instructed by bishops on a major doctrinal issue and subsequently submitting himself to their judgment. That's an odd position for one who has been given that position of authority to teach over the entire church and who is infallible. In the controversy with Pelagius, Augustine uh, makes a statement in one of his letters after Innocent I brought his judgment against, Pelag uh, against Pelagius. This is Innocent I who is then followed by Zosimus. When Innocent I made that judgment, Augustine made this statement. He said, Rome has spoken, the case is closed. Now, there are many Roman Catholics who latch on to that sentence and they milk it for all it's worth. <laughs> They allege that what Augustine is saying here is that he's affirming his belief in papal infallibility. Now, I don't know about you, but to say Rome has, has spoken, the case is closed, I mean, I, I, you have to dig awful deep to go, it seems to me, to find papal infallibility in that short sentence, but nonetheless, they do. However, such an assertion is a complete distortion of Augustine's true position. Augustine never endorsed such a position. The Roman Catholic historian, who I remind you again, taught... Uh, this is Dollinger, who taught Roman Catholic history for 47 years as a Roman Catholic. This is what he says about Augustine's statement. St. Augustine's saying has, all, has been alleged in proof of his accepting papal infallibility, which in dealing with the baptismal controversy he so often and so pointedly repudiates. Such a notion was utterly foreign to his mind. The Pelagian system was in his mind so manifest and deadly in error, there seemed to him no need even for a synod to condemn it. The two African synods and the Pope's assent to their decrees appeared to him more than enough, and so the matter might be regarded at an end. That a Roman judgment in itself was not conclusive, but that a plenary council was necessary for that purpose, he had himself emphatically maintained, and the conduct of Pope Zosimus can only confirm his opinion. You remember Zosimus basically uh, completely reversed the judgment of innocent. So for on the one hand to say, well, I believe in papal infallibility, and, and by this statement that the case is closed, Rome has spoken, when right after that with, with Pope Zosimus, they stand opposed to him, they reject him, they do not submit to him, it, clearly they do not believe that, he's, that the Pope's infallible. The next example is that of Pope Vigilius, who reigned from 537 to 555, in 553, the Emperor Justinian convened the Fifth Ecumenical Council at Constantinople without the assent of the Pope. One of the chief objectives of this council was to examine the orthodoxy of what has become known as a group of writings called the Three Chapters. 
These writings are the writings of Theodore of Matsuestia, Theodore of Cyrus, and Ibis of Edessa. Now, earlier, Pope Vigilius had issued an official papal decree known as the Judicatum, in which he opposed and anathematized these men in their writings. But while the council was in session, Virgilius reversed his first decree and he issued another entitled the Constitutum in which he refused to condemn those authors of the three chapters. These are his words. We ordain and decree that it be permitted to no one who stands in ecclesiastical order or office to write or bring forward or undertake or teach anything contrary or contradictory to the contents of this Constitutum in regard to the three chapters or, after this declaration, begin a new controversy about them. And if anything has already been done or spoken in regard of the three chapters in contradiction to this our ordinance, by any one whomsoever this we declare void by the authority of the apostolic see. Well, the council ignored his decree. They condemned the three chapters, anathematized the authors, and they anathematized as well anyone who refused to condemn them. Now, that's an implicit attack on Pope Vigilius himself. Okay, this is a ecumenical council in a subtle way letting Vigilius know that unless he submitted to them and their authority, he's anathematized. Now, since both the ecumenical councils, according to Carl Keating, as we just said, uh, heard, since both the ecumenical councils and the Pope are considered to be infallible in Roman Catholic theology, the anathematizing of one by the other offers a rather startling contradiction. The crisis was only diffused when seven months after the council had ended, Vigilius reversed himself again by submitting to the decrees of the council, repudiating the constitutum, uh, his constitutum, and he issued a second constitutum in 554. So Pope Vigilius then twice revoked his previous infallible decrees and ultimately fully submits himself to the authority and judgment of the council, which had opposed him. Now, it's interesting that Vigilius appeals when he reverses himself his last time. He appealed to Augustine's retractations as an example of an eminent father who had been forced to recognize his earlier errors. Well, it's one thing for Augustine, who is not infallible, to write retractations, which is a correction of what you consider to be errors in your previous teaching. Uh, what Vigilius is saying is that I readily acknowledge that I have been in error and I am retracting what I had taught and what I had said. And he appeals to Augustine uh, as, as one who he could point to who had done this previous to himself. Well, it's one thing for Augustine to do that who is not infallible. It's another thing altogether for an, a supposedly infallible pope to do that. So although later Roman Catholic theology would promote the dogma of infallibility, Vigilius' defense makes it clear that he did not believe that he was infallible. And obviously the council did not consider him to be infallible. They did not submit themselves to him, to his authority. Uh, they did not submit to his uh, basic point of view relative to the orthodoxy. Now we're talking about issues of faith here, uh, to his view of the orthodoxy of those writings. They repudiated him in his point of view. The most devastating historical example in my mind of the teaching of papal infallibility is the case of Pope Honorius and the Sixth Ecumenical Council. Vatican I states that all the ecumenical councils have expressed the belief that the popes were infallible. If the Fifth Ecumenical Council and Pope Vigilius were not enough to dispel such an assertion, the Sixth Council certainly is. Honorius was Bishop of Rome from 625 to 638. In a number of letters written to Sergius I, the Patriarch of Constantinople, as well as to uh, a number of other individuals, Honorius officially embraced the heresy of monothelitism. Uh, that is a heresy that teaches that Christ only had one will, the divine. Now for that, Honorius was condemned as a heretic by the Sixth Ecumenical Council, which met between 680 and 681. That condemnation was ratified by two succeeding ecumenical councils. He was also condemned by Pope Leo II, as well as by every pope until the 11th century who took the oath of papal office. The Synod, or the Ecumenical Council, makes this statement. It says that his writings were quite foreign to the apostolic dogmas and to the declarations of the holy councils and to all the accepted fathers, and that they followed the false teachings of the heretics, 
Therefore, we entirely reject them and execrate them as hurtful to the soul. And with these, we define that there shall be expelled from the holy church of God and anathematized Honorius, who was sometime Pope of old Rome, because of what was we, because of what we found written by him to Sergius, that in all respects he followed his view and confirmed his impious doctrines. Now the the council confirmed his condemnation and the decree of faith, which was eventually published in these words: the creeds of the earlier ecumenical synods would have sufficed for knowledge and confirmation of the orthodox faith. Because, however, the originator of all evil still always finds a helping ser servant by which he may diffuse his poison and therewith finds fit tools for his will, we mean Theodore of Ferron, Sergius, also Honorius, Pope of old Rome, has actively employed them in raising up for the whole church the stumbling blocks of one will and one operation in the two natures of Christ, our true God, one of the Holy Trinity, thus disseminating in novel terms amongst the Orthodox people a heresy similar to the mad and wicked doctrine of the impious Apollinaris. And then Pope Leo II confirmed the decrees of the council and, con and condemned Pope Honorius with these words, Honorius did not illuminate the apostolic see by teaching the apostolic tradition, but by an act of treachery strove to subvert its immaculate faith. Now, the significance, it seems to me, of those facts cannot be overstated. An ecumenical council, which is considered infallible by the Roman Catholic Church as well as Pope Leo II, have condemned and anathematized an infallible pope for heresy. Now, in light of the historical evidence, the theory of papal infallibility is simply bankrupt. Again, the Roman Catholic historian Dollinger uh, admits that when he says this, this one fact, that a great council universally received afterwards without hesitation throughout the church and presided over by papal legates, pronounced the dogmatic decision of a pope heretical and anathematized him by name as a heretic, is a proof clear as the sun at noonday that the notion of any peculiar enlightenment or inerrancy of the popes was then utterly unknown to the whole church. Now, keep in mind, this, this council was presided over by papal legates, they officially anathematize and condemn a pope as a heretic. Now, Roman Catholic apologists generally attempt to salvage the dogma of papal infallibility in the light of the actions of the council in two basic ways. First of all, by stating that the Sixth Ecumenical Council was an error in condemning Honorius. And then secondly, by claiming that Honorius was not giving an ex cathedra statement, but merely his opinion as a private individual or a private theologian, if you will. Now, according to this view, then, he was not condemned in his official capacity as the Pope. Well, the text of the official decrees of the Sixth Ecumenical Council proved both those arguments to be false. First of all, to say that the Council was an error is an empty argument from a Roman Catholic perspective because an ecumenical council is infallible. It can't err. So to say that it erred is a contradiction of Roman Catholic teaching. Secondly, the issue is not what opinion some present-day theologian might give about what he or she thinks about the council's action. The issue is this. What exactly did the council itself think in its condemnation of Honorius? Did it condemn him as a private theologian or in his official capacity as the Bishop of Rome? That's the question. The official text of the council tells us that uh, it condemned Honorius as a heretic in his official capacity as a pope, not as a private individual. It names him as Pope Honorius, not Brother Honorius, but as the Pope, the Bishop of Old Rome. That's his official capacity. So they are making sure we understand that this is not just a private theologian. And it says it condemns him for being used by Satan for raising up for the entire church and actively disseminating a heresy which would be a stumbling block for all Orthodox people. In other words, it condemns a pope as a heretic on the basis of what the church would later define as meeting the criteria of an ex cathedra statement. So you can summarize the situation in this way. Number one, the council condemns Honorius specifically as a heretic and anathematized him in his official capacity as pope and not as a private theologian. Secondly, he is condemned for following after and confirming the heresy of monothelitism. In other words, he embraced it himself, and then he actively taught it to others. 
And then third, he is condemned for disseminating and propagating heretical teachings in his official capacity as Pope, which affected the whole church. And there are some Roman apologists who are very irresponsible when dealing with issues such as Honorius. They're irresponsible in that they don't deal honestly with the facts and they mislead people by purposefully misrepresenting the truth. Scott Hahn is such an example. In one of his tape messages on the papacy before a Roman Catholic audience, Scott Hahn makes a statement, and I quote, No bishop of Rome has ever been accused of heresy. Well, based on the facts that we just reviewed, that's an outright lie. And he knows it's a lie. Excuse me, Mr. Hahn, but not only have they been accused, one at least has been condemned by an infallible counsel. Not just accused, condemned, thrown out of the church, excommunicated, anathematized as a heretic. Scott Hahn completely misled those people that he was speaking to, and he helped to, con- to basically confirm them in deception. That's very dishonest. In his work, Prescription Against Heretics, Tertullian makes a comment which is very applicable to people like Scott Hahn and to the Roman Catholic Church in general. Tertullian says this, What sort of truth is that which they patronize when they commend it to us with a lie? What sort of truth is that which they patronize when they commend it to us with a lie? As a Protestant who was a former Roman Catholic, I look at the claims of the Church of Rome and I ask the question, are these claims valid? I listen to Vatican I say that papal infallibility has always been the belief of the Church and was expressed by the attitude and the practice of the Church from the very beginning, the attitude and the practice of the Church councils, that the faith has always been kept absolutely inviolate by the bishops of Rome, In the apostolic see of Rome, the faith has been kept undefiled. I listen to a man like Scott Hahn say that no bishop of Rome has ever been accused of heresy. Then I look at the facts of history, in particular, the Sixth Ecumenical Council, and I have to conclude, such assertions are false. They are lies. And I ask with Tertullian, what sort of truth is that which they patronize when they commend it to us with lies? And that's what they're doing. Falsehood. Another historical example is that of Boniface VIII. In 1302, Boniface issued his famous bull, Unum Sanctum. The Pope authoritatively declared in that bull that the papacy has ultimate authority not only over the spiritual affairs of men but also over the temporal powers as well and that they were therefore to be subject to the Roman pontiff. It also declared that for every human being, the condition for salvation was submission to and obedience to the Bishop of Rome. Now, that was later reaffirmed by Leo X, by Pius IX, and by Vatican I. Anyone who refused to submit to the Pope, according to this teaching, in either temporal or spiritual affairs, was a heretic and forever lost. This is how Boniface phrases it. We declare, say, define, and pronounce to be altogether necessary for salvation that every human creature be subject to the Roman pontiff. You couldn't get a clearer ex cathedra statement than that one. We declare, say, define, and pronounce. Let's be clear about this. (laughs) It is altogether necessary for salvation that every human creature be subject to the Roman pontiff. Here you have the ex-Cathedra statement from a Roman Catholic perspective of an infallible pope on a decree specifically related to salvation and therefore to a major article of the faith. No one can be saved who refuses to submit to the Roman pontiff. Now, since this teaching deals with salvation, it must be a condition which has been true from the very beginning of church history. This cannot be a new condition established for the first time in the 14th century if it is truly apostolic. It must be sanctioned by the word of God and by the unanimous consent of the fathers. Well, where do you find such a condition in Scripture? You show me where that's in Scripture. Where do you find that condition in the writings of the church fathers? It isn't there. It's non-existent. It is, in fact, a novel teaching that was introduced in the 14th century by Boniface VIII. This is an infallible ex-cathedra decree which states that all men who have opposed the Bishop of Rome, such as Cyprian, one of the major church fathers of the church, died out of communion with the Bishop of Rome. 
opposed him to his face. The entire Eastern Church and all Protestants are condemned to hell for their refusal to submit to the Bishop of Rome. Yet today, the official teaching of the Roman Church is that non-Catholics can experience salvation. We are called separated brethren. Well, that's a direct contradiction to the decree of Boniface VIII, an ex cathedra decree which is infallible, which was later affirmed by Leo X in the 16th century and by Vatican I. According to Rome, we're not separated brethren. We are condemned. We are anathematized. We're not separated, brother, and I'm really tired of present-day Roman Catholics saying that. I'm, I read that in Vatican I, or excuse me, Vatican II. Vatican II, in making that statement, directly contradicted what Vatican I has said, what Council of Trent has said, and what other popes have said as the Boniface and Urban from 1623 to 1644. The Roman Catholic Church officially censored and then condemned Galileo for teaching the Copernican theory of the solar system. Now, the church was not in this situation claiming authority over science. And this is, in this argument, what you hear Roman Catholics say is, look, you're, you're saying you're, you're out of the realm here of infallible statements because the church doesn't claim infallibility in issues related to science. We're not saying that about the Pope. Well, that, we're not saying that about the Pope here either. That isn't what the issue was all about. It's not just an issue of science. It impinges on science. But the condemnation of Galileo didn't have anything to do with science. Directly. It had to do with scripture. The church was not claiming authority over science. It condemned the theory because in its view it was contrary to the teachings of scripture and the church possessed infallible right to determine the proper interpretation of scripture. And they viewed Galileo as contradicting scripture and promulgating his teaching about the universe. With the full approval and authority of the Pope, the church declared and defined an issue of faith which was proven to be wrong. It was not the Bible itself that was wrong, but the particular interpretation the Roman Catholic Church had adopted that was wrong. Dr. George Salmon makes these statements. He says, the history of Galileo makes short work of the question, is it possible for the Church of Rome to err in her interpretation of Scripture or to mistake in what she teaches to be an essential part of the Christian faith? She can err, for she has erred. You see, some teach that in condemning Galileo, the Pope was outside of the realm of faith and morals, that he was speaking as a private individual, and that therefore the issue of an ex cathedra statement and infallibility does not enter the picture. George Simon goes on to help us to clarify our understanding relative to the whole issues of these uh, papal condemnations in Galileo. He says, I need not tarry over the plea that either Paul in 1616 or Urban in 1633 erred only as a private doctor, not as a pope speaking ex cathedra. With regard to the problem when the pope speaks ex cathedra, the only rational distinction is between his official and his non-official utterances. We do not hold the papacy responsible for everything Urban may have said in conversation with Galileo. But in all the transactions which I am discussing, it is clear that neither Urban nor Paul acted as a private doctor, but as pope. It is said, however, that the Pope is both teacher and governor of the church, and that though infallible as teacher, he may err in the steps he takes as governor for the preservation of the church's discipline. But when the punishment of heresy is concerned, it is impossible to separate his disciplinary from his teaching power. It may be assumed as certain that the Pope would not punish a man for heresy without first having ascertained that the doctrine which he held was heresy. And the Pope could not teach the world more distinctly that a certain doctrine is heretical than by setting the example of punishing a man for holding it on the basis of the interpretation of Scripture. These men are acting in their official capacity as Pope on an issue of faith because they say it is heretical. This is not just an issue of science. The Roman Catholic Church teaches that the Popes are responsible for church councils they rule over church councils, and that they must be confirmed. The decrees of councils must be confirmed by papal confirmation. It's taught that the councils teach infallibly. And since they are ruled over and confirmed by popes, their teachings, when they are confirmed by the popes, also reflect then papal teaching. Brian Tierney makes mention of the fact that historically, supposedly infallible councils under the leadership of supposedly infallible popes have contradicted themselves. He gives us one, one illustration. He says this, that the church's erred must seem self-evident 
if we acknowledge that self-contradiction is an indication of error. One example will suffice. Let us consider the morality of religious persecution. The Fourth Lateran Council enacted the following decree in 1215. We excommunicate and anathematize every heresy that raises itself against the holy Orthodox Catholic faith. Secular authorities, whatever office they may hold, shall be admonished and induced and, if necessary, compelled by ecclesiastical censor that as they wish to be esteemed and numbered among the faithful, so for the defense of the faith they ought publicly to take an oath that they will strive in good faith and to the best of their ability to exterminate in their territories subject to their jurisdiction all heretics pointed out by the church. The Second Vatican Council declared in 1965, this Vatican Senate declares that the human person has a right to religious freedom. This freedom means that all men are to be immune from coercion. In such wise that in matters religious, no one is to be forced to act in a manner contrary to his own beliefs, nor is anyone to be restrained from acting in accordance with his own beliefs. Now, one is a contradiction of the other. On the one hand, we're saying we're going to exterminate all heretics and we're going to coerce them to believe as we believe or we're going to force them out of the country or burn them at the stake. You don't get much higher in the form of coercion than burning at the stake. And yet, on the other hand, we come to 1965 and we're told, no, that's, that's not correct, that's wrong. Men are not to be coerced. Well, I agree with Vatican II. But if you lived under Innocent III in the 13th century, it was a very different day. Well, in addition to the facts, the, the facts that we've gone over related to the papacy and these particular popes, there are also historical facts regarding the attitude of the early church towards the bishops of Rome that we want to look at as far as individual fathers are concerned. Just a couple of examples. For example, time and time again in doctrinal controversies, you find early fathers rejecting and opposing the opinions and the decrees of the Roman bishops. Hippolytus in the third century, Tertullian, I believe, in the third century also, both stood against the popes of their day on doctrinal issues. Hippolytus actually accused uh, Callistus and Zephyrinus of promoting the Patripassian heresy. Now, whether that's true or not, uh, we, we don't know for certain. But it, it's very clear that if you're accusing a bishop of Rome of being a heretic, you don't consider him infallible. We've already mentioned how the North African church refused to recognize the decrees of Pope Zosimus relative to the Pelagian controversy. That's reminiscent of Cyprian, who was also a North African, who opposed Stephen, along with a large number of Eastern bishops on the issue of heretical baptism. Uh, when you read the writings of Cyprian in his letters, it becomes very, very clear that neither he nor those other bishops who were involved in the controversy were proponents of the doctrine of papal infallibility. Quite the opposite. They accuse him basically of heresy and that he's being used of Satan to divide the church. See, those incidents are merely reflective of a prevailing attitude in the overall church of the first centuries relative to the bishops of Rome on doctrinal issues. According to the view of the church universal, the, the bishops of Rome were as capable of falling into error as anyone else. If he, if he embraced error, he was to be opposed. If he was standing for truth, he was to be followed. And that's true of any of the bishops. That was their basic attitude. Now, that attitude was crystallized in the split that occurred between the Eastern and the Western churches that's an incident which highlights the error of the Roman Catholic interpretation of Matthew 16. The Roman interpretation claims infallibility for the Pope and the Church as a whole and primacy of rule and authority for the Bishop of Rome. The Eastern Church rejects the Roman Catholic interpretation of those verses and obviously, therefore, it does not consider the Roman Pontiff to be infallible in matters related to faith and morals. That's one of the basic issues over which they split and over which they are split today. So historically, the church has never accepted this theory and this teaching of papal infallibility. Now, one final historical example that I want to go over, which in my mind completely undermines the teaching of papal infallibility, is what I call the moral test. And this has to do with the moral lives of the popes and the evils which have characterized the papacy throughout much of its history. Rather than being an, an institution marked by true spirituality and holiness and truth, it has all too often been characterized by greed, by simony, by ambition, by murder, licentiousness, immorality, materialism, and lust for power. When you combine the facts of the moral lives of individual popes 
the Babylonian captivity of the papacy in Avignon, France, when two and sometimes three popes reigned at the same time. You couple that with the Inquisition and the Crusades, you have hundreds and hundreds of years of pure scandal. There's actually a period in papal history, and this is, uh, if I'm not mistaken in this, this is also true in sec by secular historians when they view the history of the Middle Ages, not just church historians, but secular historians. There's a, there is a period in the 10th century known as the pornocracy. It has to do with the papacy. But they call it the pornocracy because it was so gross. J. N. D. Kelly summarizes that period of history with these words. He says, the 10th century is the darkest of the dark ages. The papacy itself lost all independence and dignity and became a prey of avarice, violence, and intrigue, a veritable synagogue of Satan. It was dragged through the quagmire of the darkest crimes. Pope after pope followed in rapid succession, and most of them ended their career in deposition, prison, and murder. And when we say murder, we're talking about one pope deposing another, putting him in prison, and then having him murdered. He says, the chair of Peter actually became filled with the paramours and illegitimate children of three politically powerful Roman women. In other words, the popes were their lovers, and they had illegitimate children, and those illegitimate children eventually became popes. You have the example of the Renaissance popes in the 15th and 16th centuries. Are we to believe that a man like Alexander VI, who reigned from 1492 to 1503, and who fathered nine illegitimate children, and carried on affairs with married women as pope, in addition to being involved in many other crimes, or that his immediate predecessor, Innocent VIII, who fathered at least 16 illegitimate children, are we to believe that such men are infallible spokesmen for God? They aren't even in the kingdom of God. How are they going to be spokesmen for him? There's such a thing as moral heresy. And these popes and many, many others were moral heretics. Scripture says this, they profess to know God, but by their deeds they deny him. That's a moral heretic. We profess to know him, but by the way we live, we deny him. See, heresy is a denial of the faith. Well, the faith involves more than just doctrine. It involves the way I live. It impacts me morally. Now, Roman apologists will make excuses for wicked popes. They won't deny that wick wicked popes have existed, and they have been abundant. They don't deny that they existed. But what they say is that infallibility has nothing to do with indefectibility, that is, with a sinful, with, with holiness of life, with one's moral life. It has to do with teaching and with being prevented from teaching error. Well, the problem with that is that Scripture teaches us that we not only teach by what we say, but by how we live. These men were not simply men who occasionally fell into sin, okay? We're not talking about men who are trying with all their worth to live a holy life and they stumble. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about men who absolutely embraced evil with everything that was in them. Their whole life was consistent with evil. Every waking moment was evil, <laughs> There wasn't anything righteous about them. The gates of hell have certainly prevailed against such men. Philip Schaff makes these comments about Alexander VI. The character and career of Alexander VI afford an argument against the theory of the divine institution of vicarial prerogatives of the papacy, which the doubtful exegesis of our Lord's words to Peter ought not to be allowed to counteract. If we leave out all the wicked popes of the ninth and 10th centuries, forget for a moment the case of Honorius and other popes charged with heresy, and put aside the offending popes of the Renaissance period, Alexander is enough to forbid that theory. Could God commit his church for 12 years to such a monster? The papal theory of the succession of Peter, even if there were no other hostile historic testimony, would founder on the personality of Alexander VI, who set an example of all depravity. The Crusades were promoted from 1095 to 1270. The Inquisition from 1215 through the 18th century in Spain. That's a span of nearly 700 years. Both of which, the Crusades and the Inquisition, both were promoted vigorously by the papacy. Now today, that's a real embarrassment to the Roman Catholic Church. It will basically teach that those policies were wrong. But the Crusades and the Inquisition were promoted on the basis of papal indulgences, 
which extend forgiveness of sins to all who meet their specific conditions and who participated in and helped to promote those papal programs. How could an infallible pope offer indulgences to individuals to promote practices which are contrary to the very spirit of Christianity and the revelation of Scripture? That's how they promoted all of that they did. They offered indulgences to people. A free ticket to heaven, in a way. If you will give me your money, or if you will give me yourself and become involved in this particular program, be it the Inquisition of the Crusades. Men were promised all sorts of spiritual benefits if they would go on the Crusades. Those Crusades were horrible. I mean, there are, there are still ill feelings today because of what these so-called Christians did in these Crusades. If the Lord Jesus Christ had in fact endowed the bishops of Rome with the gift of infallibility, this would have become self-evident in the course of church history. But our survey of just a small part of ecclesiastical history shows the fallaciousness of the claim of papal infallibility. The evidence simply does not support the teaching. Neither the biblical evidence of patristic interpretation nor the evidence of the facts of history. By decreeing papal infallibility and basing it on the foundation of unanimous patristic interpretation of the facts of church history, Vatican I has demonstrated what one might call a fallible infallibility. That is, this is not, it is not infallible, and such a doctrine based as it is on falsehood cannot be true. I want to summarize the study of authority very quickly relative to the tradition of Roman Catholicism. We have looked at the basic topics of scripture, tradition, and the papacy, which come under the broad heading of authority. You can best summarize the Roman Catholic teachings by contrasting its claims on the one hand with the actual facts on the other. And what you're dealing with here is an issue of truth. It's a truth of history. It's a truth of scripture. The Roman Catholic Church makes certain claims which it says can be validated by scripture and by the facts of history. And it condemns to hell everyone who disagrees with its teachings or who opposes its teachings. The question is, are those teachings true? Can the claims, in fact, be validated by Scripture and the facts of history? The answer is an unqualified no. We're not being anti-Catholic in making a statement like that. We're simply being honest with the facts and giving an objective appraisal based on those facts. Well, what do the facts tell us relative to the subjects that we've looked at? Scripture, tradition, and the papacy. On Scripture, the Roman Catholic Church claims that the teaching of Sola Scriptura is unscriptural. That is false. We have seen that the express teaching of Scripture is sola scriptura. It's as clear in Scripture from beginning to end as the teaching on the Trinity. The Roman Catholic Church claims that the teaching of sola scriptura is unhistorical. That is, that it contradicts the universal teaching of the early church. That is false. Sola scriptura was the universal teaching of the church fathers and for the church as a whole up through as late as the latter part of the Middle Ages. Roman Catholic Church claims that it established the canon of Scripture. That is false. The New Testament books were already recognized in the church prior to the Roman councils of Hippo and Carthage. The Jewish canon did not include the Apocrypha, and the church as a whole never accepted the Apocrypha as part of the canon of Scripture to as late as the, well, just prior to the uh, Council of Trent, all the way through the Reformation in the 16th century, the first general council of the Western Church to include the Apocrypha in the canon was the Council of Trent in the 16th century, contrary to the universal practice of the Jews and the Church up to that time. On tradition, the Roman Church claims that oral tradition is a second source of divine revelation that is equally as authoritative as Scripture and was the view held by the fathers of the early Church. That is false. Such a view contradicts Scripture and history. Scripture never teaches that tradition is inspired and the fathers rejected that teaching of oral tradition as a Gnostic heresy. That particular teaching the Roman Catholic Church teaches us about tradition was a Gnostic heresy that was rejected by the fathers of the early church. The church up to, the church as a whole up to as late as the 14th century never viewed tradition as a source of revelation. We conclude then that the Protestant teaching on scripture, tradition, and the canon is true both to scripture and the teaching of the truly Catholic church. On the papacy, the Roman Catholic Church claims that papal primacy is validated by the teaching of Scripture in Matthew 16 and its interpretation of the rock and keys, and that this interpretation can likewise be validated by the unanimous teaching of the fathers. That is false. 
Matthew 16 does not imply papal primacy, for the passage says absolutely nothing about successors to Peter. And the unanimous consent of the fathers opposes the Roman Catholic interpretation of Matthew 16. The Protestant interpretation is endorsed by the fathers of the early church. The Roman church claims that papal primacy can be validated by the facts of history and that it was the universal practice of the church in the very beginning. That is false. The facts of history reveal just the opposite. The attitudes and practices of the fathers and councils reveal that the church never viewed the bishops of Rome as being endowed with supreme authority to rule the church universal. And in fact, historically, there has never been a universal ruler, human ruler, over the church universal. The Roman Catholic Church claims that papal infallibility can be validated from Scripture in Matthew 16, Luke 22, and John 21, and that the Roman interpretation of these passages was that which was also given by the unanimous consent of the fathers, as we've seen, that is false. No doctor, no father, no theologian or canonist of the church for the first 14 centuries interpret those passages in agreement with the Roman Catholic Church. They never interpret these verses to even imply the teaching of papal infallibility. The universal teaching and belief of the church was that the bishops of Rome were fallible, that they could and that they did err. The Roman church teaches that papal infallibility can be validated by the facts of history and the universal practice of the church. That is false. The facts reveal that the popes have erred, have contradicted themselves and one another, have embraced heresy and have been condemned for heresy by infallible ecumenical councils as well as by the popes themselves, thereby demonstrating that the church in its practice and not even the bishops of Rome ever believed that the popes were infallible. On the interpretation of Scripture, the Roman Catholic Church claims that it alone has authority to interpret Scripture and has been granted infallibility in doing so. That is false. It is disproved by the facts of history. How can it be an infallible interpreter of Scripture when its interpretation of the most important passages of Scripture relative to its claims for authority, Matthew 16, Luke 22, and John 21, contradict the interpretation given by the fathers which make up the magisterium, which is itself infallible as an interpreter of Scripture from a Roman Catholic perspective? There's a tremendous contradiction there. The claims of the Roman Catholic Church for its authority are bankrupt. The facts reveal that the Roman Catholic Church has departed from the teaching of the truly Catholic Church and can no longer be rightly described as Catholic. It is Roman. The facts reveal that it is the Protestant Church's teachings which can be validated by Scripture as well as by the teaching of the Fathers. The Roman Catholic teaching of authority is the exaltation, in its exaltation of tradition, the papacy and the Church is a depreciation of the authority of Scripture and the supreme authority of Jesus Christ. It displaces divine authority with human authority. The authority of man displaces the authority of God. There's only one revelation of God, which is the final authority for all truths related to faith and morals, and that's the Holy Scriptures of the Old and New Testaments. There's only one head over the, the church universal. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. There is only one vicar of Christ on earth, and that is the Holy Spirit of God. These teachings on Scripture tradition and the papacy, which embody the tradition of Roman Catholicism, are based on falsehood. They contradict the scriptures, the facts of history, and the practice and the teaching of the church throughout the centuries. Tertullian's word is very applicable to the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church. What sort of truth is that which they patronize when they mend to us with a lie?